Hi, my name is Ek Dory, and uh, welcome to our little video on the technology behind FloodAware. I'm a professor of computer science here at Northern Arizona University, and my laboratory, the Collaborative Computing Lab, is working to develop the hardware and software support that um, FloodAware's, uh, the FloodAware project's using. To help me talk about our technology, I've invited Joe Eppinger, the tech lead on the FloodAware project within our lab, to help me out. Um, Joe, you want to say a few words about yourself? Hey, yeah, I'm Joe. I uh... But I'm like X said, I'm the tech lead. I have a BS in computer science. And during that undergrad, I worked with Eck uh, to sort of qualify me for this job. Yeah, so it's a interesting work. There's lots of different uh, angles to it. And um, I think part of what we wanna do is encourage people to get involved in this kind of interdisciplinary work. So uh, we're here to talk about the technology behind the FloodAware project, uh, but we don't just wanna jump in and start talking about all the geeky details. So I'd like to start by reviewing a big picture vision for just how FloodAware will work. And that will help us understand what technology is needed and why we develop the technology. And then we'll get into talking about some of the individual pieces um, near the end. So let me just share a little graphic that I came up with to talk about uh, FloodAware a bit. So you have a city here in my little graphic and the main people in the city that we care about in terms of stakeholders for this project are the city authorities that's the fire department the the, the water managers um, the police people that are basically the, the the managers and emergency responders and then of course we have the citizens as well and um, so when flood aware becomes active it's going to start uh, basically is when a, stor a storm comes in, a storm starts dumping rain on all of the city or even just part of the city. And this is where we want our smart city system to engage and to start its work. So as the storm starts falling, what we have in a smart city, what you'd like is that the smart city would have all of these sensors, which I've represented by these anonymous little spots right here, and that they are somehow sensing the flooding levels throughout all of the city. So there's thousands of sensors in the city, in an ideal smart city, that are picking up the flooding levels and they're sending them all to the flood aware system. So this smart city infrastructure. So the first challenge that we have is detecting where flooding is happening and we're gonna need to invent some technology for that. Next, you need that smart system up here to integrate all of those data streams coming in, all of that flooding information to process it to integrate it together and to turn it into a com some sort of a graphical overview. And I've just shown you an example of the kind of one that we have where the hot spots on the map are showing where the flooding is. Then of course, it has to communicate that back to the stakeholders, that is the city authorities, as well as the citizens to keep them informed about what's going on with terms of flooding. So that's the integrating part. And then the next, thing a smart city would do is it would have a smart modeling component represented by this this element right here that would take all of the live information and then throw run it through the model and tell you where it's going to be flooding in 30 minutes. So you can see the difference between the pictures. It says, hey, in 30 minutes, there's going to be substantially more flooding. And again, it's communicating that back to the citizens and to the first responders. Then the final element that you want your smart city thing to do is to be smart about it, not just to put images out there of the city and, and possible flooding, but to let people know if, they're, if there's trouble. So uh, it can let people know whether they're in harm's way, whether they're going to be flooded in a few minutes. Okay, so that's the big vision. Now let's get on to um, talking about what the technology is that we need to, to develop it. So let's think about the technologies you'd need. Obviously, there's a lot of technical challenges involved with every one of those steps. And the first one is detecting. So if you were to detect, to detect things, you'd need effective flood sensors all over the city. The more, the better. What else do we know about those sensors, Joe? Well, we know that those sensors are pretty expensive generally. So they need to be cheap if we're going to put them everywhere. Otherwise, we can only get a few out there. Right, so they need to be as cheap as possible. And plus they have to fit in the city environment. So you can't have a huge box in the middle of a roadway. So somehow they have to be unobtrusive, not get in the way of anything and yet do a great job. Now in terms of the integration step, somehow we need to beam all of that sensor data to our central processor or computer uh, in a very quick way. And then what do we need to do, Joe? 
Well, you'd have to integrate it all in real time to produce those flood maps, which means you also need a pretty fast computer up there to work through that pretty quickly. And some smart computing to generate those flood maps. And then, of course, we'd need to communicate the status back to the citizens in some way. How about the predicting part? You'd need some way to take all of that, combine it with the, some knowledge about the stormwater pipes you have in the city, and um, communicate that back to citizens. Right, and that has to happen really quickly, you know, almost instantly, otherwise it's useless, right? If, if you're not getting predictions anymore, then what's the point, you know, so. Yeah, nobody needs to tell me that my socks are already wet, right? They need to tell right, me yeah. that they're gonna be wet in 10 minutes. Right, a prediction that's that old is not a prediction anymore. Exactly. And then finally, for alerting, the, the alerting step, we'd have to know who is out there, what citizens and first responders are out there, and where they are. Right, and, and you need an instant way to alert those people to that danger, right? You, you can't just post it on a website and pray that they're looking at it at that exact moment. You need to make sure that they know about it as soon as it happens. Okay, so now that we have an idea of what the system's supposed to do and what the challenges are in designing, uh, the design challenges are to making these pieces, let's look at the pieces that we've actually made. So um, in terms of the detecting part, the core innovation that we proposed for the Flood Aware project was to use cameras as the sensors to detect flooding. The advantage is that there's tons of cameras out there in the modern cityscape already. We have webcams, we have traffic cameras, and of course, we all have cell phones that have cameras and we carry those around with us all the time. So the nice thing is because they're already out there, there there's no extra cost, they're cheap. So the trick is now just getting our hands on all of this image data, and of course, trying to figure out a way to automatically and cleverly extract the water level that you see in an image from the image. So looking at the camera web points, um, obviously there's cameras out there all over the city, like I said, but many of them are not necessarily in those critical flooding points in the city. So we had to develop some special cameras that you can easily mount um, out there in the city and um, to, to monitor those special flooding points. Uh, because they couldn't, necessarily connect to city power, we had to make them solar and independent. So we've got these smart solar powered mobile camera systems and Joe's gonna show us a little bit more about them. Right, yeah, so the, our systems combine a high-res camera over here, a cellular modem, and a, which is in this components box here with a microprocessor that controls the whole system, and a solar power system that feeds, you know, basically this whole system together. So these are some of the bits that we have inside the box. You can see over here, there's a modem and there's a network switch for some of our different components in here and a couple of other sensors floating around in here. Um, sort of off camera and unmounted are our, uh, our actual microprocessor here, which is sort of secret. So we're not showing it in this image here, but- Yeah, uh, we can't show that, we're, we're patenting that. Right. <laughs> okay, um, then, then we gotta put these things up. Is that very hard? No, that's pretty easy, actually. We just take a ladder out there. Um, we're all ladder trained and we're all safely, you know, wearing hard hats and all that sorts of stuff. We go up there and put one of these up and that takes about an hour and a half usually. And then you have to focus it carefully on the target area, right? And, and check to make sure it's working. Exactly, yeah. And so you wanna make sure that it's, it's on the exact spot that you're looking at, you know, and the gauge is in frame right there. So this is an example of one of our camera sites, uh, one of our images. And yeah, we'll come back to that gauge in a minute. We have all these images coming around from all, around the city, uh, hundreds of cameras that we're picking up and those images are streaming in. Now you and I as humans can easily look at a picture like the one that you see here and estimate the water level. The trick is how could we let have a computer be able to automatically read the water level by looking at this image? And Joe, you've been working a lot on this, on this challenge. Um, tell us a little about that. Yeah, well, so the automated extraction of those water levels from a snapshot image is sort of at the heart of what we're trying to do here in FloodAware. So it's something that we've invested a lot of our time in. We've explored a number of different ways of tackling this problem. And for, you know, for our flood cameras, the computer tries to locate a set of points in the image, like a curb or a little gauge that we've placed. And depending on which of those po uh, points are not underwater, uh, invisible, it can determine the water level. In other cases, the processor tries to find things of a known height, like curbs that are partially underwater, and try to figure out the water level by figuring out how much of that is actually underwater. 
And finally, we're exploring some artificial intelligence technique to train the computer to recognize those various water levels without any sort of gauging or anything in the image. So that's what's going on in this gauge image that you're showing us. Right, right. That's exactly what's going on here is we have a, a gauge over here and we have some water coming up and obscuring some of it. And the camera is actively uh, seeing which of those stripes are not visible and calculating the water level there. And you'll see there's some numbers here on the side. Those aren't really important for the camera. Those are actually for humans. The camera doesn't need those at all. And they're not useful. Yeah, we just use them to validate the readings that the camera, the, the processing is giving us. Exactly. So in the real world, of course, you don't get these perfect, get perfect images. This is actually a pretty good one. But there's things like lighting conditions or obstructions in the image and other real world factors means that there's no one image processing technique so far that we've found that works. So our, our plan is actually to do the smart thing. We'll just use them all. So we'll pass, we pass our processor the image and it will try all these multiple techniques on it and then compare the water level readings that it thinks it's getting from each of those and we'll use the best one. So that way we can maximize the accuracy of the readings. One of the key things we're trying to figure out with this research as well is what's the minimum level of image quality that's needed to do a reasonably job, accurate job of flood monitoring. So this obviously is very important for city managers to know who are planning to replace traffic cameras or planning to upgrade their systems in the future to know what is the minimum level of say camera resolution or color um, acuity for the camera that will allow them to allow the cameras to participate in the flood aware problems. Okay, so lots of public webcam cities have these traffic light control cameras at about every intersection. Plus we can play it at place our own flood aware smart cameras everywhere. And we can use those that image processing to figure out changes in water level everywhere. But there are some other data streams we pull in, right? Yeah, exactly. In addition to all that camera data, we also grab some data from some traditional monitoring stations that the city might already have. These usually look like some really fat, long vertical pipes, and they're pretty expensive to install. And obviously, you can't install them in the middle of the streets, and they're, they're hard to find a good spot for. So you'll usually find them measuring flow in drainages or creeks within the city, but not necessarily in a highly urbanized area, you know, where people are walking around right next to City Hall. Yeah, but we might as well use everything we can. So we do pull in all the data from these conventional existing stations as well to help our flood aware system. And let's not forget one of the most important sources of information of all, namely the citizens. We know that all, we all know that social media have become a big source of information these days, and we want to use this for flood aware. When floods happen right in front of people, they take pictures of it, they tweet about it, they send pictures to Instagram, and they post updates to their Facebook pages. And we've developed a smart social media miner that monitors these feeds for useful information. Joe, what, do you, what can you tell us about how that's coming along? Right, so social media sites like Twitter or Facebook, they pretty much all provide what's known as an application programmer interface or an API for short. And this allows our server to interface with and monitor the full stream of tweets that are coming in from a particular region. FloodAware, the server, then analyzes these streams, po uh, these posts in real time using a variety of smart techniques to pick out posts that are talking about flooding. Hashtags, you know, uh, whether or not it's raining, what people are talking about, all those sorts of things, and then uses this information to help focus FloodAware's attention on those areas where the flooding action really seems to be most intense. Now, one interesting fact here is that most people know or should know that your, your Twitter posts don't actually have their exact uh, inf location information attached to them. That's for your own privacy, and yet we can still use those. Right, and that's, that's true. We don't know the exact location of the person that's making the post, but it's labeled with a broader region. Like for us, that's north of Flagstaff. So we can essentially track flooding as it moves through the air generally um, and track the storm. And that can help us focus our attention on flood cameras in that region specifically. Okay, so we have thousands of pieces of data coming in every second from all of these data streams, the camera, the sensors, the social media miner. And so we have the detection part for the flooding covered pretty well. What we need now is something to bring it all together and to do something with it. And that's what we call the flood aware processing core. It's a central server that integrates all the data streams and produces the flooding visualizations that will provide to citizens. So the core is really the heart of the whole system. Its main job is to take all of these things in, process them into this, these flood maps, and then, um, and then show, them out to, show them to the different stakeholders in the city. 
Joe, do you have a flood map you can show us and talk about a little bit? Yeah, I sure do. Here's one that we generated recently for a neighborhood right here in Flagstaff next to NAU. You can see how it shows this drainage moving through the, the neighborhood and then shows an overlay of some different colors to indicate the extent of the flooding there. These darker colors near the center, of course, where the water is a lot deeper. And around the edges of the drainage, you can see some, you know, some lighter colors where the water's not quite as deep, maybe a couple inches, something you can step through. And the this flood map's generated sort of live based on the information coming in from the flood aware sensors, right? Right, exactly. Plus the powerful modeling engine that we have working in the background in flood aware can also start with the current flooding situation and generate some predictive flood maps showing where it will be flooding soon. So you could basically click a button to look forward in the future 10 minutes and it would show you a flood map of that prediction. All right, and that prediction is actually super important. So it's nice to know flooding's happening now, but it's even more useful to know what it's gonna be where it's gonna be flooding soon. So uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to the modeling engine right now. That's fairly complicated stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Hydrological modeling is sort of a whole topic in and of itself. And you can check out the separate video about that that our modeling experts have made. But in a nutshell, the modeling engine has detailed knowledge about the city's stormwater drainage system and can combine this with the information on current waterfall or current rainfall and water levels to predict levels throughout the system going forward in time, including where the stormwater system gets overwhelmed, which is what causes flooding. Right. So the flood aware processing core is pulling together all of the live data streams from out in the streets, plus detailed weather and rainfall information from the National Weather Service, plus using social media to track where else people are seeing flooding, and beaming this all back out to city managers and citizens via the mobile app and the live web portal, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so this must take a lot of processing power, and the question you have to ask is what if the flood aware server like drops out or gets flooded out? Right. Well, that's sort of a, an issue that you experience with old systems that are sitting in a basement somewhere. That's not our system. Our system actually exists on the cloud, which means that its compute uh, power is actually loaded, located in distant server centers. So, and, and with that sort of uh, technology, we actually don't worry about a single localized attack or any sort of issues. These cores can be replicated at several places for reliability, and we can increase processing power on demand. This means that Floodware can easily grow to support new cities across the country pretty easily and pretty cheaply. Great. So we've talked about the processing and we talked about the sensing. That just leaves the most important part, namely how the, all this information gets communicated back to citizens and the city authorities. Close the loop, we'll use, we use the two most popular, popular information channels in the modern world, namely the web itself and mobile computing. So let's start with the mobile computing side. So to give us a really powerful link between FloodAware and its citizens that worked 24-7, no matter where the citizens are, we're building the FloodAware mobile app. It will work on iOS or Android, and anyone that's using the app can see a gra graphical map showing flooded areas and areas predicted to be flooding soon. It also has special mechanisms for emergency responders, allowing them to be directed to flooding trouble spots in real time as the storm evolves. Yeah, that's great. So that means that we can notify city crews of impending flooding in some area and they can get over there and do something about it. Right, exactly. They can go put up some sandbags or anything that they need to do. But normal citizens really do need to be involved as well. First, they can use the mobile app to view the current flood map as where as where FloodAware is predicting it will flood soon. Plus, if they're standing in an area of danger of being flooded, the GPS on their phone allows us to allows the app to give them a notice that they're in a flood threatened zone and it will give them an alert to make sure that they get to safety. Actually, that's cool. Yeah. So the app watches out for citizens by monitoring this flooding in real time. And then it actually also allows them to contribute data, right? We let them send in some data points. Right. That's right. Flooding happens in unexpected places all the time. We can't count on having cameras in every single spot where it might be flooding. That's where flood aware counts on citizens like you and, you know, normal citizens and Anyone with the FloodAware app can take a, a snap a picture of flooding and it instantly becomes another valuable data point for our FloodAware system as a whole. This technique actually is, uh, is well known. It's called crowdsourcing. You may have heard of it. And applications like Waze have used it for traffic control. If you've ever used that to navigate, it's everybody's phone is contributing information. For FloodAware, it means that we can use this to essentially extend our monitoring network dynamically as flooding develops and citizens out there notice it. So citizens of the smart city kind of themselves become smart sensors. Of course, the small screen of a mobile app is good for sending alerts and showing some basic information, but it's not suitable for bigger or more detailed analysis tasks. 
So we also have the FloodAware portal, which is known as a web app, that allows city managers and emergency responders and the public too, of course, to monitor flooding events as they happen. Right, but the web portal uh, isn't only for users like city personnel. It can also be used by anyone, the general public. Ah, yeah. So the neat thing about it is it could show different information to different people. If you are a general public person, you would see one set of information in one interface. And if you were, on the other hand, a city manager, you'd log in, you'd authenticate. And once you'd logged in, you'd have access to more detailed views and tools. So for example, you could go back in time and load up a previous storm, analyze that storm, see where the stormwater system failed, and then plan future improvements to the stormwater system based on that. So really, the FloodAware portal is like the homepage for FloodAware, where everyone can come and find out information of, of, about FloodAware and the data it's capturing. Well, I think that about covers it for FloodAware technology. Let me just summarize the highlights real quick. The overall idea, idea is that a FloodAware smart city would be quietly and continually monitoring the flooding situation 24-7, 365 days a year, and being aware of the situation at all points in the city at all times. When weather comes in and flooding threatens, the smart city provides citizens and managers with complete awareness of flooding in real time and alerts them if they're in harm's way. Plus, in retrospect, it could help city planners analyze exactly what happened during flooding and allow them to, to improve in a focused way the stormwater infrastructure. Right, and the nice thing here is that in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't even cost that much. First of all, uh, cameras and cell phones are already out there. And second, the cost of our cameras, networking and smartphone technology, cloud computing, they all continue to drop very quickly. By piggybacking on a bunch of existing data sources, sit, pretty much any city can become you know, a flood aware smart city for a pretty modest cost. Great. The last thing we should talk about is how far along we are. So we're about halfway through the project right now. What else are we work? What, are, what exactly are we working on, Joe? Right. So we've developed and tested our smart cameras, and they're out there, out there collecting data pretty much every time it rains. Right now, we're in the middle of monsoon season, so they're active right now. The processing core has been up since year one, and it's being improved all the time. We're able to generate flood maps for the incoming data for our study areas in Flagstaff, Phoenix. We're working on adding Tucson as well. And the modeling mobile app are in progress as well, right? Right. Our modeler colleagues at ASU have produced working models for Flagstaff and Phoenix and are working on integration or integrating them into our prototype now. We hope we can test the predictive capabilities during the mo upcoming monsoon season. Right. And finally, the mobile app's moving along. We have a working prototype that's able to receive flooding pictures from citizens. Um, but the analysis of these free form pictures is still not up to the accuracy we're hoping for. So we still have to work on that. So we have the ways to go, but we're making good progress. Um, thank you for watching our little video and uh, I hope that you enjoyed and were able to learn something about the technology behind Flutterbird.